Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. Next, we want to come to the heavy metals. We want to limit ourselves to nickel, copper, as well as zinc and the respective alloys. In this video, we will first deal with nickel alloys and copper. Most of the nickel produced is used as an alloying element for steels, and only about 10 to 20 percent is used for the production of nickel materials. This table lists the properties and typical applications of nickel and nickel alloys. Nickel materials are generally quite corrosion resistant and are characterized in part by excellent mechanical properties. Strengths on a par with steel are combined with extremely high toughness due to the face-centered cubic lattice structure. Nickel-based alloys, for example, are often used where corrosion resistance and high mechanical properties are required, such as for coolers, reaction vessels and pumps in plants in the chemical and petrochemical industries. Nickel also forms a passive layer under atmospheric conditions so that it is resistant to non-oxidizing and weak acids. Copper additions increase the resistance of nickel to chloride and fluoride ions as well as hydrofluoric and sulfuric acids. Nickel-copper alloys are very resistant to dry gaseous halogens in contact with hydrogen chlorides and in alkaline solutions. In Canada, there are extensive deposits where nickel and copper ores occur together. Smelting these ores produces a natural alloy containing 68% nickel, 30% copper and some iron. These are known as monel. Because of their resistance to hydrogen chlorides, they are used in seawater desalination plants and in chemical apparatus engineering. The nickel chromium alloys are characterized by increased scale and heat resistance. This is given both in reducing and oxidizing atmospheres. The extensive resistance of nickel chrome alloys to oxidizing attack is based on the formation of firmly adhering dense passive layers. The classic re representative here is NiCr20. In the case of NiCr20, scaling resistance extends to over 1200 degrees Celsius in air, but only to 350 degrees Celsius in sulfur and halogen containing atmospheres. Nickel-based alloys with chromium and molybdenum as main alloying elements are due to their excellent corrosion resistance in both oxidizing and reducing corrosion media, always used where the resistance of high alloy arsenitic stainless steel is no longer sufficient. They also form stable passive layers consisting of chromium oxide and, in some cases, molybdenum oxide. Chromium contents vary between 15 and 24 percent, molybdenum contents between 3 and 18 percent. Additional alloying elements can be iron, aluminum, titanium or niobium. Two alloys that are mainly used here are NIMO 16CR16TI, alloy C4, and NICR23MO16AL, alloy 59. Similar to stainless steel, the presence of molybdenum improves the resistance to halogen-containing media and provides excellent high temperature resistance. Applications of alloy C4 are found in plants for the production of inorganic chemicals, fertilizers and acetic acid. Typical applications of alloy 59 are, for example, flue gas desulfurization plants. A typical field of application for nickel-based alloys is engine construction. The materials used in engine construction must be characterized by high specific strengths and excellent reproducibility of mechanical properties. Both titanium and nickel alloys are therefore used. While titanium alloys are predominantly used for the front part of the engine, including the van, because of their strengths, nickel alloys with high temperature resistance are preferred for the hot rear parts. Two groups of alloys with a special composition 
produced specifically for high temperature applications are essentially used for these turbine parts. These are also referred to as super alloys. These are rod alloys for discs and rings and cast alloys for blades and veins. These rod alloys are characterized by high strengths up to temperatures of over 700 degrees Celsius. Today, casting processes can be controlled so well that turbine blades and veins are cast rather than forged. From today's perspective, the first piston steam engines of the late 19th century had an enormous hunger for energy. The heaters had to shovel more than 10 kilograms of coal into the boilers for every kilowatt hour of electricity. The power plants converted just 1% of the heating energy put into them into electrical energy. Today's coal-fired power plants are more frugal. For one kilowatt hour of electricity, they only need around 310 grams of coal as fuel. This corresponds to an efficiency of 40%. Combined cycle power plants, CCGT, are even more efficient, achieving electrical efficiencies of up to 60%. The principle is simple. Gas turbines operate at temperatures up to 1,500 degrees Celsius. That's more than twice as much uh, heat as steam turbines. The thermal energy of the hot exhaust air from the gas turbines is used in downstream steam power process, with additional extraction of the remaining energy for district heating, overall efficiencies of up to 90% are possible in modern combined cycle power plants. As the efficiency of power plants increases, emissions of the greenhouse gas carbon dioxide decrease for the same fuel. Electricity suppliers have therefore steadily increase the efficiency of their power plants by raising combustion temperatures and increasing the pressure in the boilers. But the resilience of the material has limits. Turbine blades, for example, have to be made of extremely heat-resistant materials. Therefore, the blades play a special role in increasing efficiency, as they, in particular, have to withstand even higher temperatures. For this reason, many turbine manufacturers are trying out new materials that can withstand these temperatures. Today, nickel-based alloys are mainly used, which not only have to withstand the heat, but also the high centrifugal forces of 10,000 times the accelerization due to gravity. The next heavy metal we want to look at is copper, or copper alloys, of course. The strength of copper is lower than that of steel and the Young's modulus of 125,000 megapascal is only slightly more than half as high. On the other hand, the formability of copper is very good compared with many other metallic materials due to the face-centered cubic lattice. The importance of copper therefore lies primarily in the combination of very good values for conductivity, for electricity and heat, cold formability and corrosion resistance. The disadvantages of copper are the risk of hydrogen absorption during welding and poor machinability. Copper and copper alloys can be processed in very different ways. Many can be cast well, but also cold and hot formed. They can be joined by soft and hard soldering as well as welding. Therefore, we find copper and copper alloys in a wide variety of applications. However, the technically most important property of copper is certainly its electrical conductivity, which is only surpassed by silver. However, it is very strongly dependent on the degree of purity. Elements that are insoluble in copper are less critical than those that are incorporated in the lattice. There, they cause sensitive interference uh, potentials in the electric field. These interference potentials impede the movement of the electrons, 
so that the specific conductivity decreases. Phosphorus is one of these easily soluble elements among the impurities. However, phosphorus is also one of the most effective deoxidation uh, additives and is therefore often added when conductivity is not the decisive property. Electrically conductive material must have a conductivity of at least 57 meter per ohm times square millimeter. According to the standard, these materials are called CUETP or CUFRHC, whereby the name includes not only the reference to electrical conductivity, but also to the type of production. ETP stands for electrolytic tough pitch copper and FRHC for fire refined tough pitch high conductivity copper. Since the oxygen in the material does not bother me any more when it comes to conductivity, I can partly accept the fact that the material has certain proportions of 50 to 400 ppm oxygen. Together with the copper, this oxygen forms copper oxide, Cu2O, which precipitates preferentially at the grain boundaries. However, as soon as I want to process such material by welding, I have big problems. With oxygen containing copper, there is a risk of so-called hydrogen embrittlement. Hydrogen is very soluble in copper in the atomic state and can diffuse into the copper lattice, for example, from welding or shielding gases. If the hydrogen atoms reach the copper oxide, they react together to form copper and water vapor. Since the water vapor cannot escape, internal pressures of several thousand bar are generated. With the low strength of copper, internal separations therefore occur along the grain boundaries. As a result, the copper loses its strength and, above all, its toughness, so that it becomes brittle and thus unusable. Unfortunately, this process is re irreversible. If I now need oxygen-free copper for processing, but I also want it to have the highest conductivity, then I can only achieve this through extreme efforts during production. These highest qualities are called COOF for oxygen-free copper. If I'm more concerned with wellability and can accept losses in conductivity, then I add small amounts of phosphorus as a deoxidizer. This binds off an, any oxygen so well that it is not available for the formation of copper oxide. These grades are designated CUDLP or CUDHP for phosphorus deoxidized copper, low residual phosphorus and high residual phosphorus, respectively. According to the wiedemann franz law, electrical conductivity and thermal conductivity are directly proportional to each other. The wiedemann franz law is lambda for the thermal conductivity divided by sigma for the specific electrical conductivity equals A, which is a constant, times T for the temperature. So that you can, of course, also write it down differently as lambda equals A times T times sigma, from which we can see that the two are directly proportional. Due to its therefore very high thermal conductivity and high strength, at least compared to other materials with good thermal conductivity, copper is used for many heat transfer processes, such as in condensers, heat exchangers and preheaters or coolers. In one of the first videos we have talked about the possibility of strain hardening of copper in connection with one-dimensional lattice defects. However, due to the low recrystallization temperatures, the strain hardening achieved in copper is already cancelled at low annealing temperatures. Thank you for your attention. Join me again for the next video, which will be about brass and bronze, among other things, as the most important copper alloys.